Thank you very much, uh, MC Extraordinaire. Great to have you with us, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests. Uh, I must uh, also highlight our two wonderful gentlemen here, 38 years in the taxation department. And uh, so uh, I'd like to also say a very good morning to Dr. Sri uh, Samshum, uh, Dr. Sri Baharin, and uh, Dr. Mohammad uh, Nizam Jamilia, if I've got the name correctly. Uh, I think that was a very good uh, keynote address by the deputy uh, finance minister to get the ball rolling today. And welcome, one and all, uh, to th this morning's program, a very interesting program. And I have some very, very interesting gentlemen here uh, on stage. So I'll take the liberty of uh, doing a little bit of a PR exercise for Mr. Vincent Lee, the chief executive officer of Wavelet. So uh, Mr. Vincent Lee is an accomplished leader with a distinguished career spanning two decades. Uh, in the enterprise software and financial services. As the CEO of Wavelad Solutions Syndrome Brahada Malaysia since 2003 and Wavelad Technology in Singapore since 2001, he has been instrumental in driving the company's growth and innovation. And under his leadership, Wavelad has garnered numerous accolades, including the AWS, I just found that out, that's amazing uh, uh, web services. ASEAN Software Partner of the Year 2023. Sinchu Business Excellence Award. Sinchu, are you there? Make sure you take this down. And uh, 2007, and the Malaysia Epicta Award in 2015. Mr. Lee's expertise extends to multiple leadership roles as CEO of um, L Ledger Syndrome Brahad, Big Le Ledger Syndrome Brahad in Malaysia, and Big Ledger Private Limited in Singapore. He also serves as the CTO of uh, Sandwave Retail Solutions Syndrome in Brahan. His extensive experience includes the design and implementation of comprehensive enterprise management, portals encompassing modules such as inventory, point of sales, supply chain, and accounting. I will come back to you on the point of sales because I'm trying to uh, get a supermarket to buy your product. Anyway, now the gentleman in the center, the very handsome looking gentleman, uh, Mr. Shaharudi bin Othman, Deputy Chief Executive Officer of Tax Operations, Inland Revenue Board. Uh, better pay attention to him. He holds a Master of Management from the International Islamic University of Malaysia. Mr. Shaharudi bin Othman joined IRBM in uh, 1999 and has served in various areas of tax administration, including stints in audit, investigation, I like that, investigation, tax policy, international taxation, and management of branch and state offices. He currently serves as the deputy CEO of the tax operation. So please uh, make sure you get his phone number in case you guys have got some trouble uh, or, or you want to uh, get some good advice. Anyway, now uh, this, yes, last but not least, Mr. Brian Cheong, the founder of Syntax Technologies in Rimbrahat. Mr. Brian Cheong, CEO and founder of Syntax Technologies in Rimbrahat with 20 years experience in ERP accounting software and payroll consultancy with more than 5,000 implementations for various industries and customers. He's also the author for the three best-selling books, GST Tax Code, SQL, GST Guide in Chinese and English, coming out in more languages, especially in Russian and uh, in uh, Bosnian, and uh, venturing into Malaysia, and of course Brazilian. Uh, venturing into Malaysia's e-invoice era, is is appointed as SQL e-invoice ambassador and committee member of SQL Accounting Software, who participates in technical discussion with LHDN on e-invoice implementation. He is also one of the well-known e-invoice speakers. Today, Mr. Brian Chong himself has become a brand name in the industry, and this makes him a CEO who is also the best-selling author, speaker, and consultant, and much more. And uh, I'd like to present all these three gentlemen to you, coming to you live here at today's program. So on that note, um, uh, if any of you gentlemen have got any presentation material, uh, please pass it on to our technical team. We'll have it uh, superimposed on the screen up there. So without much further ado, would you like to start the day? You have something that you want to present on? Uh, Don't be shy. Yeah, you have a mic. There's a mic, mic there, mic there. Yeah. Okay. Um, hi. Uh, good morning. And my name is Vincent. And um, so. I, I don't prepare a presentation because I think it is important um, uh, to, to just uh, share uh, uh, in a very natural way. So um, 
my company, we develop uh, point of sales, ERP, accounting software, and stuff like that for the medium to the higher segment. Uh, so in, in, in the market, we have different type of businesses. There are some small one, medium, and the big one. Uh, for the medium and the big one, um, uh, I can tell you that we are quite nervous for our customer. Hey, are you going to implement uh, a new system soon or are you going to upgrade your software? A lot of them are currently very relaxed and very <laughs> uh, like, oh, never mind, it's okay. We, we just wait and see first. Uh, so I think uh, from my perspective, if I were to um, feedback to the various uh, government departments, Maybe, uh, maybe I think uh, government could uh, uh, um, alert the businesses. Hey, it's gonna happen already. You have to get things done. You have to get it ready. So um, um, uh, that is one message I I, uh, I can share. Um, and and also when it comes to the businesses, uh, unlike the GST, um, whereby you do your reporting once a month. And then, um, uh, and there is no need for interaction between the supplier and the business, or the interaction between the customer and the business. But for the e-invoice, because there is a lot of interaction back and forth, uh, cancellation of the e-invoice, conversion from the batch consolidated to the individual e-invoice, and then the notification, the validation, the sharing, and, <laughs> and the reconciliation, and so, so many things, right? So uh, I, I believe uh, that uh, a lot of the businesses, uh, they may need help because uh, uh, so maybe, uh, of course, the software vendors, all the software vendors, including myself, uh, we'd love to do more business. And, and, uh, but, but I think there is a gap the, the, the in terms of uh, education the, to the businesses, etc. Uh, maybe the software vendor can play some role to, to um, implement the system and uh, help them uh, solve their daily operation problem. We hope to play a bigger role. Uh, 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 yeah. So I think just two points. I don't want to go too long. Yeah. Okay, this uh, e-invoicing thing looks uh, very, very magical, uh, especially those guys who are, you know, not you guys, but those guys who like to have double ledgers. Anyway, moving on to our, um, our handsome gentleman in the middle. Uh, you, know, you know, something they said that... Um, God made all men beautiful, but bald men he made more beautiful. So <laughs> give him a round of applause, please. <laughs> That's good. Okay, go ahead, sir. Okay, thank you, Dato. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, ISI for inviting us from the IRBM to, to share in this session. And I like the, the title of the topic, Embracing E-Invoicing, isn't it, Dato? So E-Invoicing is here. Uh, everybody has to do it. All businesses have to do it. Don't run away from it. That's why I like that, that title, embracing it. Uh, so you, uh, it's uh, going to be compulsory on everybody uh, uh, starting from next year, July uh, 2025. Everybody has to do it. So why not embrace it? Uh, it's quite a, a short journey, actually, because uh, if you recall, uh, the Prime Minister or uh, the MOF uh, released a statement in the middle of 2022, uh, saying that we will be implementing e-invoicing, and now we are in 2024, just two short years uh, from announcement and you know, uh, getting the first group of uh, businesses into uh, e-invoicing. So this is a very short journey, a very condensed journey. It's, uh, it's a challenge for us to get everything ready, and uh, I, uh, we do understand it's going to be a challenge for businesses as well, but we are here to support. We've been doing uh, many engagements, uh, including today, uh, just to create awareness, sharing knowledge, um, you know, uh, getting the information out. Uh, if you do require any help, just uh, contact us. Uh, there's a, a comprehensive uh, resources online in our website. We have a microsite, uh, the e-invoice microsite. There are quite a few materials in there you can refer to, uh, but please uh, contact us uh, if you need any help. Um, uh, that's all for now. That's all. Thank you. That's fantastic. So we we'll move on to our next uh, uh, wonderful guest here, Mr. Brian Chong, the founder of Syntax Technologies, Sundar Brahan. Over to you, Can author extraordinaire. Can I walk around? <laughs> yeah, okay. please do that. Yeah, I should have given you a mobile a mic, you know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Hi, I'm Brian here. Now, um, in every seminar, I always see one of my participants, and I ask him why you come to my seminar every time. He said when he attend other seminar or from other speaker, he got one problem. He cannot concentrate. Why cannot concentrate? 
because the speaker is too handsome. So he don't face this problem when he come to my seminar. So should I sad or should I happy? Never mind. Okay. So when during at this moment, okay, what is the question you should ask your software service provider? I summarize three questions for you. First, we know we understand that originally in the uh, e invoice guide. When we send the e invoice to RHDN for validations, RHDN will actually notify the supplier and also customer that your e invoice already validated. So you'll be expecting you receive the validation details. But in the latest guide, this notification has been taken out. Meaning, after you send the e invoice to RHDN, RHDN will not notify you or your customer. The only way for you to know whether your e invoice is validated or not is through your system. So the first question you should ask your service provider is, how am I going to know this e invoice is validated or not? Do I need to go to each and every invoice to check it? Or do you have a reporting system or a filtering system for me to know which invoice I can send to my customer? First question. Second, okay? Consolidated e invoice. We understand that for e invoicing B to C is actually one of the biggest challenges in e invoicing. Why? Because let's say a consumer come to you, purchase your service or product. He said, "I don't need an e invoice." But at later stage in the same month, he have the right to request for the e invoice, which. Originally, he don't want. Now, the questions to the software vendors. How am I going to get the or track back the original cash sales or receipt and change it back to a normal e invoice within the same month? And you need to submit the consolidated e invoice within seven days of next month. Second question. The third question is, Many people that do not aware whether the government or private sector now keep on promoting something called cloud system, cloud accounting system. SaaS basis, or we call it subscription basis. I ask you one question. Let's say you subscribe to a cloud accounting software for four years, and you tend to change to another system or stop subscribing. What will happen to your four years data? Okay. Normally, you will lose all your four years data because it's like you are renting a house. After four years paying the renter, you don't want to pay the renter. You will not able to access the house. Of course, some of the service vendors will allow you to backup or so-called download in what format? Excel, text file, or XML which you are not able to generate back a normal document, a normal report. It's as good as a raw data. So to accounting, no use. So what is the solution? You ask me in my uh, Q&A later. So for media, okay, I always see one small problem. Because in media, we will do interview. So they will talk, uh, interviewee will talk about how their expression towards to e-invoicing. But I always hope that media can do one more step, okay, which is Q&A. We know that there is a lot of resource in our HDM website, okay, but for MSME, micro, small, medium enterprise, they have a lot of questions to us, okay, regarding their daily operations. After they look through the guide, they don't know how to apply to their daily operation. So that's why I do a lot of Q&A in my TikTok, in my Facebook, every week. Every day, we get about more than 100 questions, okay, from SME regarding e invoicing regarding business and others. So that's why for media, magazine, radio, okay, newspaper, if you are able to do a column, Q&A to educate or help the SMM, S, uh, MSME in Malaysia, it will help a lot, okay? 
just in case you need any help, you can get me, I'll do it free for you. Okay? Or you can find it in my TikTok, Facebook, or any social media. That's all for today. Thank you. Fantastic, uh, Mr. Brian uh, Cheong. Very interesting. Uh, uh, once we get into the nitty gritty of this uh, presentation or basically eloquent um, interaction with the audience, we would like to call you uh, to invite Q&A from the ground. Please introduce yourself, uh, which organization you're from and your name uh, so that we could take a record. Uh, lots of questions on TikTok. So, uh, you must uh, give us your TikTok um, ID as well. Good. Yeah, I was just sharing with my friends from Russia that my TikTok got shut down because I was making a lot of comments on uh, President Putin, which I happen to be a great supporter of. Anyway, uh, we'll leave that out for uh, the time being. So uh, moving forward, so um, Mr. Brian Chong, uh, Mr. Um, Shaha, um, Rudy uh, Bin Othman, and Mr. Vincent Lee, I'd like to. Uh, ask you, is there anything specific that you would like to bring? Because this e-invoicing is very interesting uh, because there's a lot of tax dodgers out there. You know, Will anyone be able to take uh, advantage in a not so healthy way of the e-invoicing? Uh, I just like to add on what uh, Ryan mentioned just now about uh, uh, helping MSMEs especially. Uh, we do take note that uh, the in the first phase, uh, our resources are all dedicated towards building the system and uh, attending to the first group, the, the 100 million and over turnovers. Now we are moving into phase two, which is helping the MSMEs, and they, are, they have different challenges compared to the first group. And we do appreciate uh, uh, people like Brian helping out the MSMEs, I think, uh, because uh, they are a big group, millions, uh, you know, compared to the first group, which is about 5,000. Uh, the MSMEs will be uh, millions of taxpayers. Uh, businesses who will be doing it next year, but we do appreciate the help from uh, the, the, the software providers especially. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to find out, you mentioned the uh, uh, MSMEs and so on and so forth, but uh, as a uh, big time tax collector, uh, where is the, the largest tax collection coming from, if you don't mind sharing with the audience? The biggest tax collection uh, you mean which, which, which segment of uh, okay. industry? Yeah. Uh, I don't have that data at the moment. Yeah. But uh, Sorry for putting you in a spot, though. Uh, no, no, no problem. Yeah. Uh, but you did ask about you know, uh, paying taxes. And uh, I, I think yeah. this is one of the, the, the main reasons why we are introducing uh, uh, e-invoicing. Yeah. Because it's all based on tax compliance, isn't it? Sure. Uh -huh. So e-invoicing can help uh, make our tax Compliance sure. rates better. Sure. Um, see, I, I um, in my travels, um, you know, traveling um, vast and wide, uh, and I happened to go to Bangladesh, and apparently these guys, these so-called taxpayers, carry a uh, taxpayer's card. The the more, ev and this guy who is a supermarket operator, he's got loads and loads and loads of awards, and as a taxpayer, the government basically gives them fantastic uh, incentives and they're also recognized for being a taxpayer like for example you carry a blood donor card i'm a blood donor and this guy says i'm a taxpayer you know so i think we should have a nice t-shirt later on i'm a taxpayer so uh, t um, so on that note i mean is the the government of malaysia uh, we, we we had um, you know the uh, um, deputy uh, finance minister um, say a few words on where this economy is heading. I'm also carrying, I wouldn't say my Bible, but uh, I always walk around with this called the Economic Outlook 2024, uh, looking at how, uh, uh, and there's a word that's called taxonomy. Would you like to share uh, what is the role of the taxation department in terms of this uh, so-called uh, nomenclature's concern? Yeah. Well, uh uh, we've listened to uh, uh, the YD finance minister mentioned this morning about the economic growth, um, uh, about the economic outlook that you mentioned just now, and how uh, the economy is growing. And our role here is to capture that, uh, to have uh, that uh, uh, the collection, the raise, the, the increase in tax collection in tandem with the economic uh, growth. Okay, 
So one area that might affect that will be the, the shadow economy, Dato. Uh -huh. So uh, relating to what uh, e-invoicing uh, initiative, uh, this is one area where we can uh, tackle uh, uh, the lack of collection uh, because we are all here uh, as uh, compliant taxpayers. We need these people in the shadow economy to pay their fair share of taxes. It's in our interest to see everybody uh, in uh, the, the tax uh, brackets, right? So uh, please support uh, e our invoicing initiative. Uh, it's, it's, it will be good for everybody, the rakyat, the country, the, uh, the economy, sure. and the people. Right. This morning, uh, Dr. Sri, uh, Dr. Mohammad uh, Nizam uh, bin Sari, organizing chairman of the Fourth Malaysia Tax Policy Forum, mentioned something very interesting, and that is only two things are certain in life. That is death and tax. So um, we have to have the spirit of uh, voluntarism among people, volunteer to pay your tax, because when you look at how the nation is going, uh, we have to support a lot of industries on the ground. And uh, when did you just find out um, how is the voluntary tax, um, you know, uh, scheme going on? I mean, do you, do you, do you have to go after people because? Uh, you, know, you know, a lot of guys, when they go to the airport, suddenly the, the door doesn't open because the guy, uh, you wouldn't believe one guy was traveling to China with me. He owed, uh, he owed some 800 bucks or something like that. And he said, hey, I can't travel out. So that's kind of, you know, so I think w should some leeway be given to business individuals because these guys are also taxpayers. But at some point in time, they do have a challenging time in their business and they can't cope, especially when COVID came around. Uh, a lot of guys went underground and they're not able to keep up with the economic progress uh, in the businesses. So maybe you want to have one or two words on that, sir. Okay, you raised the issue of tax compliance, which I did mention before. Uh, one of the uh, uh, initiatives, the, the benefits of the invoicing will be to make it easier to comply with taxes. Okay, uh, so probably some will want to comply anyhow. Uh, some will want to comply, but finding it quite difficult to comply. So that is the point of e invoicing because uh, uh, Dr. Can I share you on the uh, the evolution of tax administrations? Uh, because now uh, among the tax uh, authorities worldwide, among the tax uh, authority fraternity, the brotherhood, we work closely together. This what this is what we call uh, tax admin 3.0. Okay, uh, if you recall, tax admin 1.0 is probably the old system where you you have paper forms, paper written forms, you fill it in. Uh, uh, you have to be careful. If uh, you fill it wrongly, you have to padam uh, on that form itself. You have to erase uh, your mistakes. And then you have to post it. Or if you do, uh, you do it at the last minute, you have to find the nearest IRB office to go and queue with, uh, together with all the people who are doing it at last minute. There's a long queue to submit your written forms online. So that's the tax admin 1.0, which we ha used to have about 20, 30 years ago. Now, what, where we are in is tax admin 2.0, which is uh, more like uh, uh, self-assessment, e-filing, you submit everything online. But now, uh, still, we can find areas to improve our tax compliance. So that is where tax admin 3.0 comes in, which is uh, the main future features of uh, uh, tax admin 3.0 will be uh, use of technology and a real-time uh, uh, compliance. Uh, so, okay, that's where uh, e invoicing comes in. It's a big part of Tax Admin 3.0, uh, the use of real time uh, interactions and compliance. So, one thing that uh, e invoicing can help is to make uh, compliance by design, which is at the start, okay, uh, which is not uh, uh, something that comes later. Uh, if you can comply from the start, that makes it compliance easier. You don't have to worry later on. Okay, and that's where e-invoicing comes in. That's why uh, we require uh, uh, transactions to be validated upfront, and then uh, that's part of your compliance with the tax authorities already, instead of you know waiting for the whole year, uh, trying to comply later. I would like to uh, pose the next question to uh, um, Mr. Brian Chong. Um, you have uh, been very, very innovative uh, with your e-invoice implementation and you have a very good working relationship, uh, sorry, yeah, Ms. Branchong, sorry, uh, with the, uh, with the uh, income tax department. So uh, 
in terms of interaction with the LHDN, uh, has it been more user-friendly, uh, so to speak? Uh, definitely, definitely. LHDN is really, really effective, efficient, sure. and really helpful. Right. Okay. Um, I add on to this, uh, the speaker. Um, a lot of time when we talk about e-invoice until today, okay, until today, a lot of people think that it's just involved businesses, but it's actually not, okay. Um, last time, um, when we go and buy, example, we buy books, okay, we can do personal tax relief, okay, and the receipt in the, so for the buying books is cash sales. So, I heard that many people do this. I have this receipt, I photo step. Then I pass to my friend to do tax relief. Okay. But with e invoice, this will no longer will be happening. Because each and every, even you are doing consolidated e invoice, it can only can be tax relief for one person. So that's why e invoice is not only for businesses. It impact to everyone in Malaysia who are paying tax. I've got to think that if I go to the POS, the point of sale, and I'm swapping my credit card, and my credit card details has got my personal information, does it mean that uh, you are able to basically get your tax relief or, you know? Uh, no, not at this moment. Right. Not at this moment. It's, okay. not, it's not evolved to that yet. It's not evolved because. Payment is still an optional in e invoicing. Sure. So, but when you so called when you make sales, okay, the 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 bookstore when yep. he make a sales, he will issue a invoice, cash sales or e invoice. Sure. Okay, that point which will capture all this e invoice data that will do the e invoicing. But hopefully, okay, hopefully, uh, uh, th there is a technical discussions earlier. Okay, what will happen is. For a lot of MSME, let's say uh, uh, someone selling vegetable in the market or someone selling char kway okay, how she can do e invoicing on the spot? It's impossible. Okay, uh, of course there is a solution. Uh, we have a solution for that, but the actual most effective solution is actually checking on the payment. Imagine, let's say I don't do e invoicing. I don't need all any of your personal data. But if that transaction alone is actually an e-wallet transaction, okay, and e-wallet transactions data able to capture in LHDN and transact or convert it to become an e-invoice, then everyone, including micro-economy kind of businesses, were able to complete the whole cycle. At this moment, if we only talk about e invoicing the 55 fields and things like that, for micro businesses, there's still a lot of challenge. But if we can make Malaysia as like China, we can just do e wallet payment, then uh, e invoicing will be much more complete. This is something I have to um, also share with you. There are quite a number of businesses that force clients to pay by cash. And that's not fair. Either they are evading tax. I think I've got to speak to Dr. Sri uh, Samshun Baharin Mohammed Jamil, Director General of the National Anti-Crime Financial Center, why these guys are forcing clients or customers to pay in cash. So there's something very fishy about it, you know. Either they're, you know, dodgy about it, stuff like that. Yeah, so maybe you want to comment on that. Okay, um, yes. Uh, some businesses doing this, so-called, they have agenda behind the screen. But one thing, with e-invoice implementation, I have another point of view on this part, is imagine, after Malaysia ventured into e-invoice era, when I'm buying something, okay, or you're buying something on Facebook, now you will get that there it is a scam or fraud case. But in e-invoice era, I will not pay a single cent if you don't give me an e-invoice. And I'll make sure I get the e-invoice, I can scan the QR code and get it from LHDM website, then only I pay you money. If you apply this scenario, whether it's cash, e-wallet, or whatsoever, we will reduce fraud case and scam tremendously. 
Good. So, um, um, Mr. Vincent Lee, um, you want to add on to that before I, I, I pose a question to you um, on this? Uh, because, uh, like I said, um, you have a, um, you know, Sunwave retail solutions, which is very much into um, how we make um, payments. Yeah. And this e-invoice thing is something that, I think it's a blessing for the nation because all the con artists out there uh, who are trying to dodge paying taxes is one way of tracking them. Secondly, the amount of scams that are on Facebook, uh, even on TikTok, people buy products. I personally bought a power shower. It never arrived in my residence. So uh, either somebody at the security guard post, uh, you know, flicked it or, you know, or it never got arrived, you know, it never arrived. I mean, they come up with good ads, you know, you can do this, you can wash your car with this, you can do this and do that. So for the man in the street, this e-invoicing is so, so a powerful tool also for the LHDN to track the sales of this company. So maybe uh, you would like to uh, add on. To what Brian was saying just now about at the point of sales, and then uh, maybe the smaller businesses uh, may not have a computer at a park retail shop, right? So maybe they need a mobile phone, uh, easy kind of, uh, easy, something easy to use. Uh, actually, from my perspective, uh, for me at least, most of my customers are medium size consumer electronic IT shops, they have the computer at the, at, the, at the shop. But even then, it is not convenient for them to, at the power of sales, when they have a long queue uh, at the power of sales, what is your SST number? Okay, what is your name? What is your email? What is your phone number? What is your PIN number? Oh my God, I think the queue will be so long, right? So, uh, so what, what happened is that um, uh, it forced the business at the point of sales uh, or ERP or accounting to actually need to be connected to each other. So they have an e-commerce, maybe they are using Shopify or Magento or WooCommerce or whatever uh, uh, e-commerce. And then this e-commerce need to be connected to the point of sales, need to be connected to the accounting. Why? Because there are, there are many interaction back and forth between the customer and the business. So um, um, I, we hold the view that we believe that the, the data hub or some sort of a middleware uh, to allow businesses to do the integration across different systems become uh, very important. And we cannot uh, think that the ERP or a, a accounting software is an integration hub because they are not, they are accounting software. So an uh, integration hub is an integration hub and uh, uh, therefore it, it, it functions best to do integration. Thank you. Uh, uh, Edo, can yes. I add on sure. uh, a few points uh, that I've picked up from my panel, fellow panelists? Uh, number one, uh, Brian mentioned something about you know the, the dodgy dealings. You know, uh, uh, that's one thing about uh, the, the interactions between the seller and uh, the buyer. That's one. Uh, this is also a highlight of e invoicing for businesses themselves for internal control, because uh, one uh, side benefit of e invoicing is uh, it's uh, a good deterrence against internal fraud, right? So if you need everything to be validated with a third party, which is uh, uh, the IRBM, so it acts as a deterrence uh, against you know, internal fraud. Uh, it can happen uh, in any company, especially in big companies where you are anonymous, a worker can you know, you do false invoicing, stuff like that. So if uh, e-invoicing comes in, that can uh, act as a control uh, uh, in the company itself. So that's one benefit for the businesses themselves uh, when you implement e-invoicing, right? That's point number one. Uh, point number two, uh, let me see what I did. Uh, oh, uh, on the, uh, the micro businesses, uh, where the requirements for them is to issue consolidated, right? So they, they don't have to issue an invoice at the point of sale for every plate of chakwe sale they sell. They only have to do it once a month, which is uh, at the end of the, uh, the by the seventh day of the following month, right? So that will be about 12 times a year that you have to issue consolidated e invoices. And number three, uh, on what Vincent mentioned about SMEs, about payments, right? Uh, we did an engagement with uh, SME Corp, uh, and uh, they shared some statistics with us that says uh, about 50% of uh, uh, SMEs are already already have an, a digital element in their businesses, but especially on the, the front line, the front end, which is maybe on the selling part. Uh, you know, they have TikTok, they have 
we are on Shopee, like what you mentioned just now. Uh, on payments as well, it's not unusual to go to Pasar Tani, Pasar Malam, uh, uh, or roadside stalls that can accept the QR codes as payment. So on the front end, they have that digital element. But only on the back end, uh, which is where e-invoicing comes in. If they can have that e-invoicing in their back end, so that's a whole integration of the whole business process. So that's why we want, you know, we would like to see uh, e-invoicing successfully adopted by everybody. Good. Sure. So basically with all this AI and all this uh, gadgetry that we have, uh, I think e-invoice should basically uh, evolve into something larger. And this is something I did mention uh, back in the day to the Minister of Tourism. I said, hey, Dr. Sri, do you know how many tourists arrive today? Or do you know what's the spending of the tourists today in Malaysia? And there are systems out there that can actually implement that. So with regards to the LHDN, are you able to give a blow-by-blow -blow account on how much tax you're collecting per day? Or uh, how much revenue? You know, you got the SSD. You go there, swipe your credit card, you buy something, 6% bang on your head. So how do you determine that? Yeah. Okay, everything is possible if we have the data. Yeah. Right? Yeah? All right. Uh, uh, so uh, that is also one uh, benefit for e invoicing for the nation. Mm. Because we have that data, we can do analytics, we can do analysis. Sure. Right? Uh, so uh, we learn from a few countries. Uh, uh, I, I don't remember if it's Brazil, probably that three remembers. I think it's Brazil where they've, they've had. Uh, e invoicing for so many years already is fully matured. But when it came to the pandemic, uh, the COVID uh, situation, uh, uh, businesses had to be closed. They used the uh, data from e invoicing to target their aid, uh, their, their bantuan. So that is one uh, aspect of uh, e invoicing that can help the nation getting data. Helping with the government uh, decision making, you know, uh, targeting areas where areas that need to be targeted. So, so uh, the possibilities are endless you know, when it comes Fantastic. to having data with e invoicing. I, I, uh, there's a gentleman uh, <laughs> that ran a campaign called Endless Possibilities. <laughs> I don't know whether you guys know him, but uh, anyway, um, I would like to take this opportunity to open up the floor metaphorically speaking, to uh, the uh, guests who are present here today to pose any questions on the Q&A part so that uh, we could make this an interactive session. So uh, on that note, uh, talking about Brazil, I think uh, Mr. Trentini, would you like to talk about uh, what's happening in Brazil? Uh, Mr. Hardy Trentini works for a, for a very large uh, um, venture capitalist group called EVC. Uh, he's here today. So perhaps you would like to give us the Brazilian perspective. Brazil like is our role model when it comes to yeah. uh, implementing so. invoicing. They've done it very, very well. So, uh. so, so okay, now, I, th I think uh, what, what's happening in Brazil was, was quite interesting and maybe not different than Malaysia. Brazil is quite, quite known for people who don't volunteer to pay their taxes. They don't like to do that unless unless they really get made to pay. Um, the Brazilian government uses um, technology fairly well, I, I think. Um, a lot of the processes are quite quick. Um, they integrate uh, very well with uh, e email technology, online form technology, and, and the processes move along quite quickly. Um, the, the taxing situation is always, in Brazil, continues to be a challenge because even with, with the e-invoicing that they've had for many years, taxes are a bit like water, you know, people are always looking for ways to, 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 to try to evade or pay less or minimize. And it's, it's almost a bit of a national sport in Brazil from that standpoint. <laughs> Not very proud of that, but it, it's that way. Um, I think one of the challenges that that um, that you may may find is is the the back end and the number of transactions that have to be processed successfully. So, 
Uh, I'm, a, I'm a, bit, a little bit familiar with, uh, with the plans for, uh, for the e-invoicing here in Malaysia, and it's, uh, I think it's a good idea. It will be great for the country. You know, everybody can pay their fair share. Um, I, I was looking ahead a little bit, and I'm wondering if there was any plans on your part to, uh, to take this sort of at some point to the next step where since all the businesses and people are, have all the information going to the revenue service, right? Then do you have to file taxes at the end of the year? You already have all the information for businesses, for, for individuals. Okay, uh, ultimately that is the, obje the ob objective. Oh, is it? But okay. we can't do that yet until everybody comes in, come in uh, comes on board and the system becomes fully mature. At the moment we have, uh, uh, we are starting to roll it out, uh, uh, giving a few concessions here and there. So that is not possible yet. But ultimately uh, we've seen, I've, s uh, I've seen s a colleague from Hungary, not even a colleague, uh, uh, a s speaker from one of the big fours from Hungary that says uh, now uh, sending their tax return is just r reviewing and signing off mm. uh, because of the uh, e-invoicing uh, initiative implemented in Hungary. So that is our objective ultimately. Um, I'm supposed to be answering questions, but now I have questions myself. Um, Go ahead. Can yeah. So my question is, uh, does it mean the way we do audit the way we do uh, tax submission, I mean, those yearly audit that we are doing now, uh, or not now, but in the future, there is a chance that it could be uh, no longer required. Good question, thank you. Uh, as things stand in the current tax admin 2.0 regime, so what happens when uh, audit, I know, uh, Vincent, what you're referring to, audit is quite a headache lah, when the IRBM officer comes in, what happens, uh, so let's just imagine uh, I'm working for your company, I do my e invoicing. So, okay, today I have a sale, uh, one million, okay, I do my e invoicing. And then what, what happens is I uh, aggregate all the invoices I do at the end of the year, right? 31st December, say. And then I file my returns in July of 2025. And then uh, probably your, the company gets picked up for audit. So the audit officer from IRBM comes in at the earliest say Q quarter one of 2026, right? So that is uh, two years already. He comes in in 2026 asking to see the invoice I did today. That is two years behind, two or three years down the line has already happened. So maybe your, I've already retired, so I've moved on to an, uh, another company. Uh, the invoice okay. is already in the warehouse it's somewhere, you have to go look for it. Maybe it's uh, damaged by flood or termite or something like that. So that's the current regime when you do the normal uh, paper e invoicing. With e invoicing, with every, uh, every data online, number one, uh, it's all there to be viewed. Okay? And number two, like I mentioned before, what Tax Admin 3.0 uh, uh, is attempting to do is do more real time interventions. Right? So you don't have to wait two years down the line for me as uh, at the tax authority to come and ask you something that happened two years ago. So it should be a real time, more real time. It gives you that chance to correct before you close your accounts for the year. Okay. Uh, my question is, let's say if you look at Singapore, right, a uh, uh, company with a cert revenue below certain number of million, uh, you are exempted <coughs> from doing the, the, the or even go through the process of the audit, uh, uh, those audit submission, because now you have all the data Maybe one button, you can see everything yourself, even all the uh, information that the business do not have because you are able to connect from one business to another even. Correct. You know? Correct. So uh, uh, easier uh, Thank uh, you, easier uh, compliance and less uh, interventions. So probably, like you said, if you have that data already, everything is good. We don't catch out you already. La. We only catch out those where we can see uh, 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 discrepancies. discrepancies. So yeah, uh, I like this because in the, in the hospital industry, because I was doing biomedical engineering maintenance of Prince Court Hospital, we have planned preventive maintenance. So like the taxation department, and also our good friends at Tanaga National Brahat, they have an estimated bill. So can you estimate 
how much tax somebody can pay? Just a quick one. It's been done at the moment anyway, Datuk. Uh, because okay. companies and uh, businesses do have a tax estimate. The issue is whether those estimates are correct. But with more information, more data, sure. it can be as accurate as possible. Sure. So by the time you, you do your final uh, tax calculations, it's, it should be as close as possible to your actual tax bill. Sure. Before I uh, pose the next question to Mr. Uh, Brian, um, just wanted to find out if any of you have got anything related to what we are discussing right now on this um, uh, estimation or guesstimation that we call it. Uh, you know, I mean, like I said, you know, when I took gave his speech this morning, I was saying, you know, this is so accurate, you know. But in the spirit of uh, volunteerism, I think uh, companies must be more forthcoming. But anyway, when you talk about um, estimation, maybe in one year, the guy's business has been good. And then, you know, like this Aussie guy who told me that somebody did a boo boo in his factory and he had to lose a 20 million Aussie contract supplying biscuits to her, you know. So how do you tax? I mean, basically, there's a sudden drop. You lo lose business. So are you going to whack the guy? Uh, <laughs> whack is a nice word. Uh, the same taxation that you estimated. Would that happen? Would he have a scenario such as that? Um, I would also like to ask uh, Mr. Brian, uh, Mr. Chong. I mean, of course, uh, LHDN can answer that. Well, of course, uh, we administer income taxes, uh, which, uh, you know, is... Uh, roughly based on the profits for the, for the year, mm. right? So that's the thing with profits; it's, it's volatile. It can yeah. go up and down, up sure. and down the, uh, among years. So, mm. uh, will the basic principle of any tax authority is not to tax a single cent more or less? So uh, it should be fair for everybody. You, you guys play a fair game, right? Okay. We hope so. We okay. Hope so. <laughs> Good. So I'm going to uh, members of the media or any one of you out there who's got a question um, that you would like to ask, please uh, raise your hand, and the mic will come to you. Anyway, Mr. Hardy Trentini, thank you very much for that comment in Brazil. National sport. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. Give him a round of applause, please. Um, well, I wanted to ask our friend from Russia, um, you know, who is the the counselor. Uh, Mr. Alexei Salry Rob, uh, Salnikov, um, how is it in Russia? Do you have an e invoicing in Russia at the moment? Just, I just wanted to know. Do you have an e invoicing? Uh, can the mic be passed to? Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, nice, to hear, nice to be here. Uh, frankly speaking, uh, about 10 years ago, it was a situation like in Brazil now. It was like a national sport to avoid from taxation. But after introducing uh, e invoicing, uh, almost all, ca all, all entities, including physical persons, uh, are paying uh, their taxes without any delays. Uh, frankly speaking, we have a very big e portal, national e portal and uh, all information are accumulating all the way. Our national uh, taxation uh, service are connected to this portal and uh, receiving uh, online all information about all expenditures, all uh, revenues. Uh, in this regard, so I think now we have uh, no problem with paying tax taxes. And uh, the biggest uh, advantage of our system is a flat rate, a taxation flat rate, yeah, for personal individuals. Uh, now it's uh, 30 percent. Now we have some plans to update it, but uh, for time being it's flat and very convenient. And now uh, I think it's uh, more expensive uh, to find a way to avoid from taxation when to pay it. Uh, as to the business, uh, business have a higher taxation, about 20, 25, but uh, it's also flat rate. And uh, I, I haven't heard maybe during last 10 or five years that uh, any big companies uh, make some attempts to avoid. And uh, if uh, they do, uh, if they do this, they have uh, very serious penalties up to the closure of their business. Yeah. Uh, can I comment? Yes, Britannia. So can I comment uh, from, uh, from our, uh, on our colleagues from Brazil and Russia, uh, you know, saying that uh, tax evasion is a national sport. I I think it's wishful thinking to say that we can eliminate tax evasion entirely. That's wishful thinking. It will, it will never happen. But uh, what it will happen is to make it harder, more difficult to evade taxes. And that is supported by uh, some data, statistics that we see 
whenever countries implement uh, uh, e-invoicing, they'll start to see uh, an increase in uh, tax revenue at least three or four years down the line. So uh, that, I think, supports uh, the, the reason why we do invoicing, to make it harder to uh, evade taxes. I think Mr. Vincent Lee is uh, very eager to um, add on to that. Uh, I just want to add a little bit because we are talking about all this compliance, compliance thing. My customer, they have a very good idea. They say that uh, last time it was so difficult for me to get my customer who come to my shop to buy things to actually sign up for an e-commerce account. Now, uh, uh, because of the e-invoice, uh, we will tell them that uh, at the point of sales, we are not issuing the e-invoice directly. So you have to go to the customer portal uh, to sign up for a username, password, and then download the e-invoice, etc. Uh, then I can have the opportunity to actually give them another voucher so that I can cross-sell, upsell, you know, and stuff like that. So uh, it's very interesting view from businesses where um, how they look at this e-invoice uh, it is not just for compliance, it, it could become a CRM initiative uh, for the e-invoice, yeah. Mr. MC, you're very quiet. How much time do we have left? Because uh, I don't see the scorecards out there. I think we've got uh, five minutes to go. So very quickly, uh, can I have a question from that side? Uh, you seem to be, uh, yes, the gentleman there, the very good looking guy there. Yeah, sorry. Please introduce yourself here. Yeah. Good morning, my name is Mohan. A simple question, has any ethical hacking been done on the e-invoicing? Ethical hacking. Very interesting, so uh, yes. Uh, okay, you can answer that, yeah, go ahead. Uh, actually, currently, MZEC um, uh, is also getting all the software vendors uh, to um, test themselves for the PEPO. Uh, to join the PEPO network because uh, PEPO is one of the ways that businesses can share their e-invoice documents with other businesses. But of course, uh, once they are on the PEPO network, the businesses can use the PEPO more than just e-invoice. They can also think, let's say, purchase order, delivery order. It's not a requirement from LGN to think any of the purchase order, uh, right? So, uh, but they can use it. And also, uh, when it comes to passing the test, as a PEPO uh, accredited uh, access point, uh, uh, as though the P PRSP, the, the PEPO ready service provider, uh, there are certain security requirements that uh, the IT vendors will need to pass. Uh, for example, they need to go through the uh, ISO 27001 and then uh, with the uh, two-factor authentication and uh, 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 some penetration testing and stuff like that. So there's, there's a series of requirements that the IT vendor will need to fulfill. I would say, yeah. Yeah, I know. I understand the concerns about you know uh, security because quite a lot of sensitive data is in the uh, my exactly. invoicing uh, uh, system. But uh, we do engage with in NATSA, uh, the National Cyber Security Agency, uh, where they give us uh, advice. Uh, they share with us some uh, knowledge, uh, best practices that uh, we need to undertake to make sure the system is foolproof, completely safe, and. I what Vincent said, uh, we do several layers to you know, protect the system, authentication, uh, uh, data encryption, uh, using all the standard, the industry standards, uh, all the ISO we have to follow, there are government circulars and guidelines that we need to comply with, and also what you mentioned, penetration testing, that's quite important to make sure it's, you know, it's very secure. Okay, I have a follow-up question. I'm not stopping anyone else. <laughs> Reminds me of decades ago when the Singapore Stock Exchange system went scriptless. And then one nominated member of parliament said, an elephant can walk through. So the Stock Exchange of Singapore had to engage one of the big four auditors to do a review. And a few other interesting points came out. So, if that can happen in the stock exchange of Singapore, can it also happen here to us? I'd like to add on to that, uh, Mr. Mohan, because uh, the Ministry of Health in Singapore was hacked, and, uh, and all the data, you know, the payments uh, made by patients, what sort of payment was made, uh, 
you know, this is why HIS, Hospital Information System. So I believe a huge chunk of this e-invoicing is also, I mean, it's across the board, so to speak, medical industry, you know, because everybody visits the doctor or the dentist at least once a year. Some have all these so-called uh, ailments. So maybe um, the LHDN could address that issue on cybersecurity in e-invoicing. That's a, it's, it's a very, that's a loaded question, uh, Mr. Mohan. Go ahead. Uh, you want to address that, uh, okay, you uh, see Mr. Vincent? Okay, you hack a server, uh, usually there are two things they can do. Either they modify the record inside, they access to edit, or they want to take out the data, right? So uh, either I, I, I extract the data or I modify the data, do something on it. So um, when, when it comes to um, the answer to solving this problem, uh, we can take a look at the blockchain. Uh, if you look at the blockchain, uh, it is open, everyone can access, but through the encryption, <laughs> nobody can modify it. <laughs> so you cannot modify it. And then uh, when, you, when you think about uh, using the concept of a blockchain uh, for the two-layer protocol stuff, you can actually encrypt the data and store the encrypted data and uh, when one somebody want to use the, that you don't have the original data, that means that you have an original data, you encrypt it to become a signature, you cannot know what is the original data, but you can, if somebody gives you something, something you can say this is correct or this is not correct. So, so there are many ways, uh, techniques that uh, could be used to, to actually ensure that, uh, let, let's say blockchain, uh, uh, this Bitcoin is accessible by anywhere, anyone in the whole world, but no, how, how to hack it, right? So, so, um, uh, so I believe uh, there, are, there are ways to overcome this problem by different techniques and different method methods. Thank you. Um, quick question. I just wanted to ask uh, Mr. Brian Chong, did you bring any of your books uh, that you've written? Because this would be a good market to market your books. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not doing a PR uh, no, no, sales no. show for you, but okay. just to ask you. The, the a, yeah. three books I, I publish uh, is so-called obsolete because that is during GST era, that is GST hex code. And the other two is actually like a user manual for how to use the software itself and during GST era. So it's already obsolete. Sure. Okay, uh, add on to the security questions. Actually, LHDN during our discussion in the technical uh, discussions, they already foresee all these things and they already done all these preparations and encryptions into that. So I believe that uh, LHDN already do, do the best what they can at this moment. Of course, we cannot say that it won't be happen, okay? But uh, because we know that who is handling the back end of the e invoicing I believe that they are the best in the world. The people who are handling the back end of e invoicing will be the best in the world. Okay, so for, for consumer, for taxpayers, uh, we I can say that you can be confident that uh, whatever challenges that you, you foresee will be tackled by LHDN and their team also. Okay, we've come to the end uh, of this uh, morning session. I would like to take this opportunity to thank our fantastic guest, Mr. Vincent Lee, Chief Executive Officer of Wavelet, Mr. Shaharudi bin Othman, the Deputy Executive Chief Executive Officer, Tax Operations, Inland Revenue Board of Malaysia, and Mr. Brian Chong, founder of Syntax Technologies. Thank you very much.